So as you can see outside, there are a number of problems with the way that drones are currently manufactured. For example, the drone is fairly noisy taking off. And the other thing to keep in mind is that drone battery packs right now, at least this one, last a little bit over 20 minutes. So obviously, it'd be very beneficial to improve the efficiency of a propeller. So drone propellers that are manufactured right now, they look very much just like the propellers on an airplane or a helicopter. Now, one way that we tried to improve this was to think about, okay, how could we make a more efficient propeller? And so I came up with my own invention, which is to put winglets on the end of a drone propeller. So while the regular propeller works like this, the propeller with winglets works like that. The idea behind winglets is it makes for a more efficient flight. And so I'm hoping that by putting winglets on the end of a drone propeller, I can have a quieter and more efficient flight. So, since this is my invention, I'm gonna take you through the steps of figuring out what you need to do as an inventor if you have a drone-related invention. So the first step is really, does it work? Well, obviously, this is a prototype that I built from a standard drone propeller, two ukulele picks, and some scotch tape. So I need to have a real prototype made. But let's say that it works, and I want to go forward with the next step. The next step is, is it patentable? So to figure out whether something is patentable or not, you want to do a prior art search. Now, you should learn as much about doing prior art searches as you can on your own. Do your own prior art search, and then my recommendation is, to hire a professional patent searching organization to do a professional prior art search for you. So what does a prior art search do? Well, it looks for existing patents, published patent applications, things for sale, things in any publications, or any other public disclosure that could count as prior art against your patent application. So basically, you're hoping to accomplish two things with a prior art search. First, is there an active, valid patent out there that covers my invention, in which case I may not even be able to make my, my drone with the wingtips on the propeller. I may not even be able to make this invention. The second issue is, okay, so there's nobody that has a patent on this invention. Is this invention different enough from other people's inventions and the other prior art for me to have a good shot at getting a strong patent off of it? Now, a lot of people don't realize that there's a difference between a strong, high-quality patent and a very weak, narrow patent. So it's not a matter of you get a patent that's good, you don't get a patent that's bad. Uh, you really want to get a strong patent that's going to be a broad patent that will pretty much protect the entire invention as well as hopefully some people who may try to uh, knock you off and uh, change the invention just a little bit to get around it. So the goal again of a prior art search is to find all the prior art out there that could count against you if you file a patent application and it's examined. So we're going to do our own prior art search first just to show you how it's done. So the first thing I did is I just got on Google and I typed in um, winglets, propellers with winglets, and various combinations like that that somewhat describe my invention. And so the first bit of prior art I found was a number of articles that dealt with how winglets work. And as you can see uh, from these articles, basically when you put a winglet at the end of the, the wing, it decreases the vortex that's formed at the end of the wing. And by decreasing the vortex, uh, you have more efficient flight. So 
The first thing are just articles that describe something similar to the invention. These are valid prior art. The second thing we found was a paper by NASA that discussed putting winglets on the end of helicopter blades. Now, I'm not too worried about trying to get a patent over pictures of winglets at the end of a plane blade because my invention is very different in that a wing just stays there uh, immobile on the edge of an airplane, whereas uh, a helicopter blade with winglets, all of a sudden I'm getting a little less comfortable because that is much closer to my invention. So this NASA paper is valid prior art. It's an our article that was written that was out there on the internet. So I've got to worry about this one as well. The third bit of prior art is actually a picture of a Sikorsky helicopter with winglets at the tips of its helicopter blades. So even a picture alone, even without a description, even without a patent application filed, just a picture can be prior art. So I've got to look at this Sikorsky picture and see whether this could be a danger to me as well. So another bit of prior art that I found was a patent application for a wind turbine blade that has a winglet on the end. Now we're getting really close to home because a wind turbine spins around to generate wind energy. If they thought about putting a winglet at the end of that, well, um, you know, in between that and the Sikorsky helicopter blade with a winglet at the end, those are very close to my actual invention. And because of uh, the, some recent cases that came down on what a USPTO examiner can and can't do in terms of rejecting a patent, it's entirely conceivable that a USPTO examiner could look at my application and say, well, you know, the combination of putting winglets on a helicopter blade combined with this wind turbine winglet, that would make Eric's invention something of an obvious improvement. So anyway, published patent applications and issued patents are also prior art that you have to look at if you're thinking about trying to patent your invention. So the last bit of prior art that I found was an actual product for sale on the internet. And this was a propeller blades for a wind generator that had winglets at the end of the propeller blade. So products for sale are also valid prior art. So when you're doing your prior art search, you also want to look for things uh, that are for sale because even if it's for sale on eBay or Amazon.com or even Craigslist, you know, if there's a picture and or a description out there, this can be valid prior art. So these are the kind of things that you look at when you're doing a prior art search. My advice is after you do your own prior art search, if you still think there's hope in patenting your invention, you want to go to a professional prior art search company. Show them everything you found and say what else can you find to supplement this. So with respect to prior art searches, a lot of inventors have an attitude, well, I'm not going to show them anything because I want to make sure they do their job. I think this is the wrong attitude. The, the prior art searching companies, they'll put a certain number of hours into a prior art search. And if you don't show them the easy stuff that you found, maybe they'll spend the first five hours of the 15 they allocated to your prior art search just finding stuff you've already found. So I think you get much better results if you show them what you found and ask them to spend all their time trying to find things that you didn't find. So after you've done your own prior art search and you've analyzed the prior art that the professional prior art searching companies found, you have two main questions. Number one, is there a valid existing live patent out there in the country in which you want to sell your invention, in this case the United States, that covers the invention? If so, you'll be infringing somebody else's patent by making your invention. If there isn't a valid active patent on your invention, that doesn't mean you're home free because the second law that you have to worry about is 35 U.S.C. 103. 35 U.S.C. 102 says if somebody else has invented your invention before you, you're not going to get a patent on it. 35 U.S.C. 103 says if your invention is a mere obvious improvement over other people's inventions, you're not going to get a patent on it. And so looking at, at my invention here, I'm, I'm not concerned under 35 U.S.C. 102 because my invention is not the same invention that these other people have patented or have, um, have, have sold on the market. But I am worried about 35 U.S.C. 103 because my invention is very close to a couple of these bits of prior art that I found. So I want to take that into consideration when I'm deciding what type of patent I might want to file for. So after you get the results back from the prior art search, you want to look at a couple of laws and see how they relate to you. 
The first law is 35 U.S.C. 102. 102 says if somebody else has invented your invention before you, under certain circumstances, you're not going to get a patent on it. And indeed, you may be infringing somebody else's patent if you happen to find a patent that's still active and valid and it covers what you're doing. Uh, to figure out whether you're infringing, you need to look at the claims, and um, uh, this video doesn't have two and a half hours of extra time to go over uh, how to not infringe claims and how you might be infringing claims. So suffice to say that if you infringe the claims of an active and valid patent in the country in which you're making use of your, or selling the invention, you can be infringing somebody else's patent. So the first thing you get out of a prior art search is, can I even make my product? The second thing you get out is, uh, am I likely to get a strong utility patent out of it? Now a utility patent covers the function of an item or how something works, as opposed to a design patent that covers how something looks. So prior art searches are really designed to let people know, let inventors know, whether or not they've got a reasonable shot at getting a utility patent. Because for most inventors, a utility patent will give them the most protection. However, under some circumstances, inventors will try to get both a utility patent and a design patent. Under other circumstances, such as where there's an awful lot of prior art out there, they may skip the utility patent entirely and just try for a design patent. So let's go over these three patents in some detail then, the provisional utility and design patent applications. And maybe as we go through, you can see some of the pros and cons of how I would apply these to this particular invention. The simplest type of patent is a design patent. These are fairly inexpensive. Uh, they have a very good success rate. Well over 90% of design patent applications end up issued as patents. They, again, they're relatively inexpensive compared to utility patents, so they're very desirable in terms of cost and in terms of success rate. However, because they just cover the shape of an item, it's much easier to get around a design patent in most cases than it is a utility patent. So a design patent on this would emphasize the fact that we've got winglets at the tips of the propellers. But if somebody wanted to, to think around this and they put the winglet in the middle and they put a, a, a winglet just trailing on the other underside, they might be able to avoid my design patent more easily than if I got a utility patent that covered the entire function of modifying the wing with some sort of winglet somewhere to make it more efficient. So again, with design patents, you're protecting the shape of an item and a design patent again is fairly inexpensive has a very good rate of success. Now the shift gears a little bit. If you want to try to protect the function of an item there are two ways you can go. The way that a lot of people will go is they'll file a utility patent application. These tend to be expensive. They're usually uh, at least three times as much as a design patent application and Utility patents right now, as of this filming, they have roughly a 50-50 chance of success. The standards for granting a design patent are much less, much lower, than are the standards for granting a utility patent application into a patent. So, um, if you have an invention, your chances of getting a design patent are much better than your chances of getting a utility patent. Now, with a utility patent, it also takes a lot more time for the patent attorney to prepare them because we have to prepare things called claims, you have to have really nice drawings that show exactly how your invention works. And generally, utility patents take maybe 20, 25 pages of writing as opposed to design patents that are usually one or two. So again, with a utility patent, you're looking at usually three times or more the cost of a design patent application, a success rate around 50%. And yet, if you do get a utility patent, particularly a strong utility patent, you're probably getting the best type of protection you can hope for. So ideally, I'd get a utility patent and a design patent on my invention because that would keep the competitors away best. However, a lot of people, such as me, um, they don't have a very good prototype. They don't really know how well this is going to work, and they want to do some R&D before they pay for the utility patent to be prepared. So for them, there's something called the provisional application. Now, a provisional patent application is not examined by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, so you don't get patented or not patented. It's not approved or denied. So the provisional gives you a one-year grace period during which you can do some more R&D. Try to perfect your invention. Try to raise investment money. Perhaps even sell the invention outright. Make some prototypes, test the market, get some feedback, do some focus groups, get on Kickstarter, kind of whatever you want to do with that year 
trying to perfect your invention to the point where when you file the utility patent application, you know exactly how your invention is going to work. So provisionals are great in a, in a situation like this where we think it's going to work, but we really have to do some R&D first. So a provisional is usually written much broader than is a utility patent application. Provisionals generally cost about half of what the utility patent application costs. And at least at our firm, we take half the cost of preparing the provisional off the utility because we can use a lot of the provisional as an outline for the utility patent application. And the biggest problem with provisionals is that you only have a year right now to do all this R&D. And while you may think a year is a ton of time, in reality, it's very, very difficult unless you're super motivated, super motivated, and uh, you're super well organized to get a whole lot of stuff done in that year. So anyway, with provisionals, I suggest them only to inventors who really are well organized and willing to put in a lot of work during that first year to make sure that by the end of that year, they've got a really concrete idea of exactly what their invention is all about. In this particular case, I've done my own prior art search. My next step is going to be to hire a professional prior art searching firm to do the prior art search for me. I'm going to turn over to them everything I found and see what they find for me. I'll determine from the prior art search whether I'm worried that I'm infringing somebody else's patent and whether or not I think there's enough wiggle room for me to get a strong patent on this idea as a utility patent where I'm trying to protect how it works. In any case, I'm going to file for a design patent on it because no matter how close I am to somebody else's invention, my guess is this is a new enough idea so I'm going to be able to get a design patent on it. Now assuming I don't find anything that I think would be fatal to my chances of getting a strong utility patent on it, I'm going to file a provisional. And with the provisional, I'm hoping to use that year to do some R&D, practice this thing a little bit, get some prototypes made, fly this thing around and see if it actually works and modify it, hopefully within the bounds that I set in the provisional, to make sure it really works before I fi file the utility patent application on it. I've already decided on the strategy for patents. The next thing that I have to look at is, should I be worried about trademarks? Now, what is a trademark? Well, a trademark is the protection that you can get over a brand or the product name or something else that indicates where the goods are coming from. So most people want to try to trademark the name of their product. Now in this particular case, um, we're going to use my invention right here as an example of what you can look for when you're trying to trademark a name. So there are basically five levels of names in terms of whether or not you can trademark them. So we're going to start with the worst name, and this would be a generic name. So let's say I wanted to call these Winglet Propellers. Well, that's a really bad name because it basically is exactly what they are. Now, it wouldn't be fair to the rest of the world if I was able to trademark Winglet Propellers and then DJI and 3D Robotics and everybody else started making stuff similar to it and they couldn't call it a Winglet Propeller. Let's say I didn't get a patent on it. Was it, would it be fair for me to lock down the entire market on winglet propellers and make people call them something else? Well, no. So a generic name is almost always rejected by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office trademark examiners. Okay, so we're going to move up one level in terms of trademark names from worse toward better. And the next thing is we're going to use what's called a descriptive name. And a descriptive name for this would be Carlsbad Props. Now, we're in Carlsbad. Some, these are basically props made in Carlsbad. That's pretty descriptive. Descriptive names are usually rejected as well. The next level up is something called a suggestive name. Now, suggestive names have a good chance of being approved. And a suggestive name is, is kind of like a super duper version of a descriptive name in that it kind of brings to mind some sort of attribute of the product or the service being sold, but it doesn't really describe it. So for example, if we call these eagle props, that would be a pretty, a, you know, a pretty good suggestive name because it kind of suggests, okay, eagles, they fly really well, they're strong, they're a noble bird. It's kind of a cool name for propellers. But again, eagle flies, these fly. So again, a suggestive name is usually approved by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. 
but is not quite as good as the next level up. The next level up from a suggestive name is an arbitrary name. Now an arbitrary name is a name known in the English language that is not necessarily associated with the products or goods being sold. So while eagle is suggestive because this flies and eagles fly, if we use the name, say, rose, well rose is a plant, nobody ever thinks of roses flying, but it's a name everybody knows, kind of like Steve Jobs calling his computer company Apple. Apples really have nothing to do with computers, although everybody uh, knows the word Apple. So again, if you, can, if you can use an arbitrary name, that has an even better chance of being approved. The most likely name to be approved is a fanciful one. Now a fanciful name is a name that's just made up. So examples that you've all heard of would be, would be Exxon for gasoline, uh, Xerox for photocopy machines, Polaroid. What was a Polaroid before they decided to use it for cameras that printed their own pictures? These are names that were basically made up by people. So um, if we took the name Fly High and uh, rearranged the letters, we get a different word. The word is lie hyph. So if we call this lie hyph, well, that's probably a guaranteed slam dunk through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because lie hyph, it doesn't mean anything. But then again, I would take on a branding campaign to make sure everybody wanted to try to buy the lie hyph propellers. So again, if you happen to make up a name, then you've got a, you've got a fanciful name, which is usually the strongest protection you can get. However, you have to also have a branding campaign to make sure people are buying your product because nobody would logically associate that name with your product. The other danger you run into when you have a fanciful name is that uh, too many people in the community will start using it in a generic sense. So for example, uh, Photoshop, when you take a, a picture that you want to alter, people say, oh, just Photoshop that out. Well, Photoshop is, you know, they, they, they don't want their trademark to become generic, so they're saying, no, you should digitally alter it. But nobody says digitally alter it. They say, just Photoshop it out. So one of the other people who should be concerned is Google, because nobody, when they're looking for something on the internet, they say, gee, I think I'm going to do an internet search for this subject. Instead, they say, oh, just Google it. Well, Google is becoming generic for just getting on the internet and looking for something. So if you do come up with a fanciful mark, you may have to defend it too to make sure it doesn't get generic because everybody else in the industry is using it. So these are some things that you might want to think about if you're coming up with an invention and you're thinking about giving it a name. Now, not always do you have to give it a name. If you want to just invent something, get a provisional patent application filed on it and try to sell the invention outright, if you manage to sell to a large company, they probably have advertising and promotion departments that will figure out everything about what to call it, uh, what the packaging should look like, uh, what kind of advertising they're going to do for it, you know, who the, the end user is going to be. They'll figure out all that for you, so you may not need a trademark. But again, if you're going to manufacture products on your own or you think you have a name that would make your overall invention along with its name attractive to a potential buyer or investor, you may want to think about filing for trademark protection on it. A lot of inventors, they turn their ears off when they hear the word copyright because they think that copyright only applies to artists. Well, it's true that in this traditional sense, copyright protects things like screenplays, musical performances, uh, photographs, things like that. But as an inventor, you should never forget that you can also use copyrights to protect a number of things that are very important to your invention. Uh, for example, you can protect a website with a copyright. And once you come out with an invention, oftentimes you're going to build up a website, if for nothing else, than to give people an idea of what kind of product you're making and the pros and cons of it. And so you can use a website a lot for advertising. You may want to copyright your website. If you go to trade shows, you produce probably a lot of trade show brochures, advertising brochures, things like that. So you can copyright anything relating to the advertising. If you put your product in some really neat packaging, you can actually copyright the packaging. You can even copyright your owner's manuals. So as an inventor, don't tear, turn your ears off when you hear the word copyright, but instead think about whether a copyright could be used to protect your inventions, uh, artistic elements. <music>